As we begin, I want to encourage everyone, um, if you like reading out of your Bibles, turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. And before we also um, read that, I just wanted to also say welcome to everyone online. Uh, I've neglected to say welcome to you, but you are also here with us, and we are grateful for you. Um, And so thanks for being here with us. Mark chapter 11, uh, we are continuing our series on prayer. And um, for those who have been here, those who remember, we started out talking about why we pray talking about why we pray for a couple of weeks, then we talked about um, how we pray for a couple of weeks, and now we're talking about what happens when we pray. And so this week we're going to talk about answered prayers, and next week we're going to talk about unanswered prayers, because really it's one of the two, right? Um, And so this morning we are going to be reading out of Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, we're going to start in verse 12. So let's go ahead and get to it. Mark 11, verse 12 through verse 25. And this is actually um, just chronologically right after Palm Sunday, so we're doing it out of order, but that's okay. I think you'll be able to figure it out. The next day after Palm Sunday, uh, they were leaving, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Verse 13, seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not yet the season for figs. And then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem... Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. And in the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their hearts, but believes what they say will happen and it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Uh, So as I mentioned, this is right after Palm Sunday, right after the triumphal entry, and Jesus gives his disciples this wonderful lesson on prayer that I want us to look at when we talk about answered prayers. And so let's go through it. Verses 12, 13, and 14 uh, they're walking into into town. They were staying outside of Jerusalem. They're walking in, and, and he sees a fig tree. He sees a fig tree, walks up to it, and there's nothing there. There's nothing on it, and so it tells us that he curses it. He says, may no one ever eat fruit for you again. Um, I've always been really curious about this. Some of you may have been also. I I always sort of thought, I have a little bit of a cynical streak. I I always sort of thought Jesus was just hungry, went up, and just was like, oh, curse you, fig tree, and walked away. He's just kind of upset. He was a little hungry. Um, I don't think that was it. It could have happened. Uh, But really... What's interesting about this is this verse at the end when it says his disciples heard him say it. I don't think Jesus was angry. I think it was more so Jesus was setting up a lesson for his disciples. But when we talk about Jesus' motivation, I wanted to point this out because this is one of those passages that, you know, when I was in seminary, this was, I remember spending like two days on this passage and everyone arguing over what Jesus' intentions and motivation were and everything. And I remember reading it again this week, studying it and thinking, gosh, what do we want to learn from this? And thinking, I'm never going to know Jesus' intention here, right? Like depending on my mood, I may think something different. I, I am not Jesus, all right? And, and I know we know that, but sometimes it's really helpful for us to say that and remember that, no, 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 in this story, we're the disciple. We're the disciples following Jesus. We're we're following the master. We're following the teacher. And so if this has ever been something you've wondered about, um, I would encourage you, don't let it hang you up too much, but rather trust that what he did was intentional and was a good thing. Trust that what he did had a purpose. Because if we get back to our series on knowing God back in January and February, what we talk about is that God doesn't do what we want God to do, but what God does is good, right? Right? So it's like this idea of, well, does God do good things? Well, whatever God does is good. If God is good, then what he does is good. And so everything he does is good. And so in things we may think are confusing, like why did he curse the fig tree? 
Don't worry about why. <laughs> Let's focus and think about what we can learn from this and how we can see God's goodness and lesson in it for the disciples because you and I are not Jesus, but his disciples. Okay? It's clear, I think, with how Mark wrote this, that the disciples heard him say this, and as we saw them come back around the next day, that this was for the disciples. But in between, something happens. Verse 15, 16, and 17, he goes in and cleanses out the temple. He, he flips over the tables. He drives the money changers out, all this stuff. And, and church had become, at that time, the temple had become a place of commerce and not worship. Straightforward, we kind of get this. Um, if you've ever studied history, this has happened many times through, throughout the years. Many churches have done this, have stepped into these muddy waters of, of becoming a, an enterprise, becoming a place of commerce, becoming a place of profit, becoming a place of whatever. I mean, the very reason we all identify in this church and, as Protestant or evangelical is because this happened 500 years ago, and it happened a couple hundred years before that. And that's why we had a church in, in, in um, what is now Istanbul and, and Rome. And then at one time, I don't know if you knew this, there was actually three popes. There was one in France and Italy and Turkey because they couldn't agree. I mean, things like this have happened throughout all of history. But what happens is, and the reason these things happen is because people are in charge and people are broken, people are messy. They've gotten far afield from God's plan and have decided that it's about their plan. And they made worship about them. And so when Jesus comes in and changes everything and flips over the table and says, no, I'm not going to allow this anymore, verse 18 and 19 tell us that they try to find a way to kill him. Maybe it's because he was taking a major revenue stream in Passover week. Maybe it's because the people liked Jesus and not them. <laughs> they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. They hung on every word of his teaching. He had just been welcomed in as a king with palm branches. And, and the leaders were afraid of Jesus for one reason or another. Maybe it was pride, maybe it was money, maybe it was both. But they try to get rid of him. And then the story continues as, as the next morning they come back into Jerusalem after he does this thing. Our lesson gets really interesting. They return to the city and they see the same tree maybe 24 hours later. And scripture tells us it had completely withered. And Peter, again, we love Peter, right? says the obvious, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And Jesus' response here, verse 22, is great. He says, have faith. Peter, why did this surprise you? You've seen miracles. You've walked on water. You've seen dead people raised. You've seen healing. You've seen all sorts of things. And you're still amazed. Which is fine, I guess. But Peter, remember, have faith. Because, verse 23, if you pray, Peter, disciples. If you pray for big things, they will happen. If you tell that mountain to go jump into the sea, it will happen. So, verse 24, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Believe that God has already done this thing and it will come to fruition. And then he adds on this wonderful thing. And by the way, just remember to forgive each other. And by the way, be people who forgive each other. Be people who love each other. Be people, when you go to God in prayer, if something comes up in your heart, make sure you forgive other people. So, great message on prayer. What do we learn about it now for us? What does our prayer life have to do with killing fig trees and throwing mountains into oceans? Um, as Christians, we know we are called to pray. We've talked about this over and over. We are supposed to pray, right? We pray because Jesus asked us to. We pray because we get to pray. We pray because it's a gift of God that we get to actually talk to him. We, there's lots of reasons we pray. And Jesus is giving his disciples a great lesson in prayer here, I think, talking about what happens when we pray. And I don't know if you've ever felt like this, but sometimes it's, it's really hard. Uh, prayer is difficult, okay? Again, um, I, I can be totally honest with you. Prayer is difficult sometimes because we don't know which prayers God's going to answer. Sometimes we pray and it feels like we're playing darts with a blindfold on. Like we're just sort of throwing and hoping one sticks. You know, just God will answer one of these. I hope one, maybe, you know, I'm not sure. Why does it feel like? Why do we think it feels like God answers some prayers and not others? Because this is our experience, right? We pray for some things and we hear a great testimony of prayer and we say, yes, praise God, amen. And then the other one, we sit there and wonder, God, what? I thought this is what you wanted. And, and, and to be honest with you, in some ways, like Jesus cursing the fig tree, I don't know why. 
I don't know why, but over the years that I've been a Christian, over the years we practice these things and we learn to grow our prayer life, I think God begins to reveal some things to us that may help. And this scripture really helps me. First thing Jesus says, and this is the first point I just want to bring up, is Jesus says, have faith. I mean, I know it sounds really simple, right? Yeah, okay, Sam, we get it. We, we believe in God. That's why we're here at church, or we're, we're interested in this Jesus guy. That's why we're here. Okay, we believe. But really, no, have faith. Have faith because this has been the foundation of everything throughout all of human history. You know, some people will say that the Old Testament was uh, like a works-based thing, you know, like you make sacrifices and then God forgives you and that sort of stuff. But really, even the sacrificial system of the Old Testament was faith-based. Uh, the prophet Habakkuk in chapter 2 says that, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just will live by his faith. See, in the Old Testament, they had this whole sacrificial system, and that's why there was all these money changers in the temple. But they had this whole sacrificial system, but it wasn't the actual sacrifice of the animal that forgave sins. It was the people's faith in saying, I'm going to do the thing you have asked me to do, God, and God seeing the faith of their hearts and forgiving them. It was still a faith-based system. The entire thing of this life, this entire book, is about faith. It's not about following the rules. It was never about jump through these hoops and God will forgive you. It was always about faith and God perceiving our hearts in faith. This is why God saved Nineveh, the story of Jonah, right? They didn't even, they didn't know the right prayers. They didn't know the right words. They didn't have a temple, but God saw their hearts and forgave them and relented. God knows our hearts. This is why in the prophet Amos and the prophet Isaiah, he says to the people, I despise your worship. They were going through all the right motions, but God said, your hearts are wicked, This life is about faith, and if we want to be people who pray, if we desire to see answered prayers, we need to have this faith. We need to pray for healing. We need to pray for miracles. We need to pray for things that we don't think necessarily are possible. Because sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. And I want to share a quick story with you. Some of you know a little bit about my background. I grew up in sort of a tumultuous home, and one of the things that was sort of an overarching theme in my life was I grew up really without a father figure and grew up in a single-parent home. And as I got older, God was very gracious and provided me with multiple people in my life who I could look to as positive male authorities and role models in my life. And two of those, one is my stepfather, his name's Mike. He'll actually be here next week, if you guys are watching. Hi, Mike. Um, I didn't ask you for this, by the way, but I'm going to talk about you. Um, And then the other one was uh, I was a young youth pastor at 23, and one was a pastor at the church named Kit. And so I had Mike and Kit, and they were mentors. They were friends. They were people I looked up to. And within the same spring of, I forget the year, but within the uh, period of a week, both were diagnosed with very, very serious cancer, like less than 20, 25% chance of survival for both of them. And I remember actively praying and being told by people, pray for healing, pray for healing, pray for healing, pray for miracles, pray that God will do these things. And I did it. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And a calendar year later, my dad Mike was in remission and my pastor and my friend Kit was with Jesus. And I look back and I think, wait a minute. Were those prayers wasted? No. Should I not have prayed? Did I do something wrong? Did I pray wrong? Did God? No. No. I realized through scripture, through meeting with friends, through praying with faith, through having faith that God wants us to pray for these things even if they don't happen. We're going to talk about disappointment more next week with unanswered prayer. But for now, I want you to hear that right now. Hear the very words of Jesus in verse 22. Have faith. Friends, have faith when you pray. The other thing we need to do that Jesus talks about here when we pray is we need to pray with expectancy. He says, if you believe you can throw that mountain into the sea it will be done for you. Expect God to be who he is. Jeanette just prayed for this and we talked about this with knowing God and with the foundations of this. We believe that God is good. We absolutely believe that God is good. So why would we not believe that our prayers will bring God's goodness to this world? Why would we not expect God to bring more goodness to this world that we're living in? It ties back to the whole thing about knowing who God is. If we believe God is who he said he is and God is good, then why would God not desire to bring more goodness to the world? Why would God not desire to bring more of him to this world we're living in? You remember that phrase we talked about in February, the functional image of God. What is your functional image of God? If you believe things are going really well and you're sort of waiting, well, when are bad things going to happen? 
things have been going well for a while. I know bad things are going to happen, God. What does that say about our functional image of God? Do we believe he wants to bless us, bring good things, or are we just waiting for God to ruin it? Do you expect goodness? And by the way, let me be clear, goodness is not always what you want. (laughs) Goodness is not always what you want, but what God's will is and what God desires, what the Holy Spirit brings to our life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, all that stuff. We are to pray with that same expectancy that God wants to accomplish his will on earth through us. So we need to have faith. We need to expect good things to happen. And then lastly, we need to ask. We need to believe and we need to ask. You need, if you believe God is good, you need to ask for it. Ask for the things on your heart. What has God placed on your heart? Then pray and ask for those things. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 7? Pretty straightforward. Matthew chapter 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. It sounds weird, but friends, often we don't ask. We think, oh no, God doesn't want to hear from me. Oh no, that's not important. Oh no, I'm not really sure. Well, maybe I shouldn't feel that way. No, if it's on your heart, ask God. We talked about this a lot. Be honest. If it's on your heart, pray for it. And if it's not from God, and if it's something you shouldn't be praying for, pray that God takes it off of your heart. But if there is something on your heart that you say, I pray this all the time, by the way. I say, Lord, here's, here's what I want. Here's what I want to see. Make it happen. And if, it, if it's not from you, God, take it off my heart. But right now, this is how I'm thinking. This is how I'm feeling, God, and I'm asking you for it. We look at this story, and the religious leaders were not doing their jobs. They weren't. The rituals had become overwhelmed with, with all of these other things. The whole point of, of the Old Testament system that Jesus came in to teach, uh, to change, was that the, the priests and the teachers of the law had focused on the ritual rather than the purpose behind the ritual. The purpose behind the ritual was to bring God's goodness, was to bring God's redemption, was to bring God's healing, was to bring his transformation, was to bring people closer to God. But it wasn't happening. People weren't seeing God. People were not believing We need to remember, as we approach Easter, Palm Sunday next week, and then Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and Easter, and Holy Week, and all that stuff, Jesus came to bring God's goodness to earth, right? This is why in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you've heard it said this, but I'm here to tell you this. You have, you have missed it, and here's what it's actually about. It's about bringing the kingdom of God to earth, God's goodness, and one of the ways God does this is through you and through me in our prayer life. That we can pray, we can actively pray and have involvement in God's will here on earth through how he answers our prayers. And God will answer your prayers. Just this week, I, I didn't ask permission, so I can't share them, but there's been multiple people who I've talked to this week who have had answered prayers. Huge prayers answered where it's just, oh, praise God, that was such an answer to prayer. And many of you can look back as Jeanette was praying with the Holy Spirit sheltering us. How many of you can give testimony right now of answered prayers in the last week, month, year, multiple years, over the course of your lifetime? God has asked us to pray. God has given us the gift of prayer. Jesus has said that we should have faith in God and that whatever we ask for will be given to us. But we don't even ask. So friends, right now, think about it. Maybe it's faith that you're struggling with. Maybe you need more faith. Ask that God in your prayer life would give you courage and give you faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you have faith, but it's expectancy you struggle with and you don't expect God to do things. Pray and ask that you would have the courage to to expect the goodness of God and to know that he has good things for you. And maybe there's something on your heart that you're quite honestly afraid to even ask God about. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe it's a past hurt. Maybe it's reconciliation that's needed. Maybe it's something crazy. Maybe you have a a friend or a family member who you've talked to about Jesus a dozen times and a dozen times they've said, I don't care. Maybe it's time to ask again. Think about right now. Many of you right now as you sit and listen to this can easily think of one, two, three things you want to pray for in your life. You want to ask God for in your life. You want God to take from your life. You want God to add something to your life. You want God to heal something in your life. It's not hard. So here's what we're going to do. I want to stop and think. 
about one thing. Maybe it's as simple as inviting your neighbors to Easter service. Maybe it's as big as healing a hurt that you've never dealt with. The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians said this to the church. Philippians chapter 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God will give you his goodness. God will give you his peace. It may not be answered the way you think it will, and that's okay. But he will give you his peace, and he will give you his goodness, and he has promised that to us. We have the Holy Spirit. For those who believe in Jesus Christ, we have the very presence of God here and now that we can access this peace for these things that we need to pray for. So we're going to take a minute now. And if there's a miracle you need in your life to be free from something, pray for it. If there's something that's just weighing on you over and over and over again, pray for it. If you can't think of a single thing, then pray for the person next to you. But let's just take a minute and practice what we're talking about doing. And whatever God has put on your heart in the last 10 or 15 minutes as we've talked about this, let's pray for those things now. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the people in this room who have come in faith. And so, God, we pray to you now. Lord, we have faith. We expect you to do great things. And so, as your sons, as your daughters, we come under your authority and we pray. Friends, give to God the things on your heart now. Lord, we have faith and believe that you are good. Lord, we have seen you work before and we expect you to work again. And so, Lord, we ask, hear these requests. And in the powerful, matchless name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we ask that these things would come to be. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Sometimes it's as simple as that. Sometimes it's much more complicated. But friends, my hope as we go through all of this, is that we would continue to practice this thing called prayer. And that we would know that God desires that our prayers would be answered because of his love for us and because of his promises to us.